This is Control Structure, episode 146, for August 15th, 2018. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs146 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Okay. Um, you said 146. You know what Correct. other You know what other show has 146 episodes? Uh, which one is that? At the Nexus. And it was the last show they ever did. So you sure. know what that means. We're done? We finished? Uh, maybe. But that also means that Control sh- Structure is the most episodic uh, show on this network. After we do the next one, right? Because we're just tied. Um, I did a, episode zero of this. Oh, you're right. So yes, we're ahead. Yes. This is the first episode that we are ahead. Very nice. I mean, I don't think any anything will ever catch up to the fringe. Yeah, it's kind of tough when you make a fringe every time you do the show, so you're never going to catch up with that. <laughs> Unless people stop doing fringes. True. So, raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Yeah, you can yell I'm in my house. <laughs> So, uh, have you ever had your raspberry pie get too hot? Uh, not really. In what little oh. I've in what little I've used it, it has got I don't know, maybe a little warm, but it's also a raspberry pie one. Mm. And I also have like a little copper heat spreader thing on it, just like this uh, illustration. See, every time I take my raspberry pie out of the oven, it's always really hot. Pie. You know, mine too. <laughs> Anyways, uh, someone came up with the idea of liquid cooling the Raspberry Pi. Uh, kind of like how people would... Uh, oh no. Steve? Uh, I lost you, Steve. <laughs> Come back, Steve. Yeah. I'm there. Back. What? Yeah! Okay. So, anyways, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know how some people dip their motherboards in uh, oil? Yeah, I know how I... have I've seen people on YouTube do that. And where are you, buddy? I can't hear you. Uh, you hear me now? Yes. There you go. He uh, went ahead and... Uh, nope, I don't hear you. Overall, it worked pretty good. Uh, typically, the Pi runs at 50 or 70 C uh, under load. Uh, he says when he put it in oil, it was down to 37 C at idle and 48 uh, C at uh, gaming uh, after an hour. Uh, so he was very good actually so it's ran cooler than even at idle normally it runs uh and then his only problem was since he used vegetable oil uh he had some issues with it later on uh not working quite right yeah but very interesting concept i have noticed my pie because i've actually set up a pie in my kitchen on a monitor to use like as a quickie use computer for recipes and stuff and i have noticed that it, it can get pretty hot if you're playing a youtube video or something like that so it's an interesting idea there yeah, so it's I'm, I don't think I've ever seen anyone use vegetable oil for uh, uh, electronics before, uh, and probably for good reason. Yeah, he mentioned something about uh, water. So I don't know if vegetable oil has water in it or what the deal was with that. Uh, it has vegetable stuff in it. Mineral oil is like more pure oil. So oh, I got you. I believe you can use mineral oil for cooking, so that might make sense about it being more pure. Well, it's it's used for, like, actual cleaning. Oh, okay. Uh, vegetable oil is more the cooking oil. So, so anyways, um, the Windows console. So, you've, you know, even though we're sort of Linux people, uh, you've uh, actually used the Windows command line, correct? A couple of times, even though I typically use Git Bash because it's just way better. Uh, let's see, I think that's actually Sigwin, but uh, it is. Yep. Anyways, like the native Windows command line thing has always been a little special, and when I say special, I mean like short bus special, uh, in that you know it it doesn't have any of the themes of the operating system, and you know sort of you know works pretty much how DOS did. Yep. Uh, and it is, doesn't even show all the text that DOS did. So, uh, 
apparently everyone uh, has looked at the, uh, was it the Linux subsystem for Windows prompt and realized that was a lot better and said, gee, it would be great if the native Windows command line could do this. Uh, so uh, pretty soon Windows should finally be able to have reliable, effective tabbed consoles with emoji support, rich Unicode, and all the other things that Windows consoles don't do yet. So, Oh, I really needed the emoji support. That'd be handy. Uh, definitely. Uh, so it seems that like all the other sort of advanced console emulators on Windows have essentially, you know, had a console window placed off screen and scraped the data back into a window, which, you know, obviously wasn't exactly a, uh, the best solution. Interesting. So, and, uh, even though we have not, uh, you know, had a show in about a month, uh, we were probably a little bit behind on this, but Chrome 68 was released, uh, and this is the release that marks HTTP sites as not secure. So prepare, f- prepare for the deluge of people submitting vague bug reports saying that your website had a big scary error on it. So, uh, you know, sort of like how, uh, you know, like Gmail suddenly, you know, like warns people that... Uh, mm-hmm. This email was received over like a non-secure connection. Yes. Yeah, like I'm, I'm pretty tempted to uh, like go through all of the uh, emails that I get and send people back. Who, you know, it's like your your email gave me a scary error. <laughs> so um, there is uh, someone has compiled a list of the most popular websites that are HTTP only. So these are the people that should that should uh, you know watch out for this, and pretty much all of them are Chinese. Interesting. Uh, the top uh, not Chinese uh, site is Wikia, which is like the Wikipedia except for like different things. Mm-hmm. So they just haven't updated. But that's interesting. Are they still underneath the uh, Wikipedia Foundation or no? Uh, Wikipedia Foundation has upgraded. Okay. And I think they're one of the top five sites. Uh, let's see. This is the Alexa ranking. Uh, not to be confused with the Amazon Alexa. Ha. Okay, whatever. I don't care anymore. Wikipedia is very popular, okay? So, you know what else is popular? Oh, what's that? Intel processors. Uh, so if you've not been living under a rock, uh, Intel processors uh, have had some serious security vulnerabilities recently. Uh, so remember Spectre and Meltdown? Yes. So was doing the pre-execution of code. Yes. And now, uh, as of like today, as of recording, uh, you can pile on another one. The L1 terminal fault. Uh, like, I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but it involves the, uh, like, the page table, like, the memory page table. Mm hmm. So, uh, like, it pretty much stores, you know, a little bit of info of, like, what range of memory is, uh, like, in the cache and, uh, like, how it actually maps between virtual and physical memory so uh it it goes how should i say this it is expected that uh for uh pages that are not present in cache that these entries will be mostly blank uh but you know they could be used for other things and it turns out that intel uses that for other things uh and apparently when a page fault happens, uh, sometimes the entry is misinterpreted. So, uh, like this weird data is interpreted as a memory address and gets brought into the level one cache. And this is all speculative. Mm. So, like you're sort of poisoning the cache uh, speculatively. And, mm-hmm. and due to some black magic that I don't fully understand... 
this apparently only affects uh, hyper threads, and I think that's because you know when you have uh, you know a, a CPU core with two threads running on it, they sort of by definition share the same uh, level one cache. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know if you're uh, running virtual machines, you know two different virtual machines on your hyper threads. Uh, this can be a very dangerous thing. It seemed like it even let you go from the guest to the host, which that's even more uh, dangerous because that's not supposed to be happening at all. Yeah, because like the the flags and everything that uh, Intel uses in the space that's supposed to be empty gets interpreted as a physical memory address, so that the CPU goes out and uh, grabs you know, data from who knows where, which, for all means, could definitely be the uh, the host memory. And, by the way, you're not buzzing anymore. That's great. That's really strange. You're still using the same Microsoft, right? Yes, I haven't changed it. So, but anyway, there will be new processors from AMD, uh, which is not affected by the L1 terminal fault. Uh, in fact, uh, just this week, uh, in AMD has released updated Threadripper CPUs with 16 and now 32 cores. So, uh, sort of like Intel, they have those, uh, uh, let's see, they're not hyper-threads. They are, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, symmetrical multi-threading. Okay. You know, like where the one core can, you know, act as two. Uh, but because AMD does not use that supposedly blank space for anything. It's all empty. It doesn't affect them. So, yes, by all means, thread away on your AMD CPUs. Uh, So, uh, like the previous generation of thread rippers, these are essentially the cut-down server parts that, uh, for one reason or another, didn't quite make it. Um, May have some turned off cores. Is that kind of the idea? Uh, especially on the uh, sixteen core uh, variants. So how AMD does this is that there's essentially uh, four dies uh, on this huge chip, uh, and each one of those is essentially like a Ryzen die. Um, each one with uh, eight cores on it. So uh, if two of them are active, you got sixteen cores. Three of them get you 24, and all four of them get you 32. Uh, But unlike the server uh, variants, uh, the uh, Threadripper CPUs have only four memory channels, and let's see, only uh, would be 64 PCI Express lanes uh, versus eight memory channels and 128 uh, for the Epic CPUs. Um, so, you know, each, each die has a pair of memory channels and, uh, yes, yeah, 32 or yeah, 32 PCI express lanes. Uh, so if, if, uh, you know, the memory or device you want is located or connected on the other core, there's a little bit of latency between there. Oh, I see. So if you're talking to memory that's connected to the memory controller on another die, uh, that's called a non-uniform memory access, or NUMA. So uh, it turns out that Windows doesn't exactly handle NUMA too well. Uh, Linux does it a lot better, and these Threadripper CPUs uh, in turn generally perform a lot better on Linux. Mm. You know, again, because I think it has a lot to do with the fact that these are essentially server grade chips. Uh, so it has server grade chips, you know, generally have uh, a little bit more exotic architectures, uh, mm-hmm. like, like, uh, multiple CPU sockets, uh, in a, on a board. Yeah. So, you know, again, if you have multiple, uh, CPUs in a system and the memory is connected to the other processor, well, there's going to be a non-uniform memory access over to the other chip. I was thinking from a server perspective, probably if you're going to have, have a server with a monster CPU in it, chances are it's running Linux. So that might be explaining why it's more common. 
Um, well, there's that, but then uh, uh, Microsoft also has this Azure service that uh, I'm pretty sure runs you know Windows Server as a base. So, uh, so yeah, uh, looking at these uh, uh, Linux benchmarks here, that uh, apparently the uh, was it the X two sixty four encodes run much faster on Linux, uh, as well as uh, uh, was it seven zip, you know, like file compression. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, like it's it's almost twice as fast in both of those. That's pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, so that's the operating system of choice already then. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, anyways, there will be new processors because NVIDIA has released the next generation Quadros powered by their new Turing architecture. Uh, and it now features dedicated ray tracing cores. So uh, ray tracing has essentially been the holy grail of computer graphics for many decades now. And, you know, conventional uh, graphics, uh, you know, the traditional rendering pipeline for literally every video game released, uh, essentially, you know, like colors in like each little pixel individually, mm -hmm. you know, like it notices, okay, well, there's a polygon here. There's, you know, uh, a light coming in this way. And, uh, you know, that simulates, you know, some lighting there. It simulates it. And then, oh, it's colored this way because of the textures or the images on it. And it does like a whole bunch of trickery uh, to make it look fairly real. Uh, whereas ray tracing works in a different way. So, like, you know how in reality, you know, like uh, there's a light source and then light comes off that light source and bounces around the room and comes into your eyes. So ray tracing essentially works that backwards. It sort of shoots rays out from wherever you're looking at uh, into, say, a room or whatever you're looking at, mm -hmm. and then calculates the, the light bouncing around. So Literally going from the point of view of the person who's looking at it, going out to see what they might be seeing. Exactly. So that would save you processing because instead of wasting time on everything coming with the light source, instead you're focusing only on what I can see. More or less. So with that, you pretty much automatically get very realistic looking lighting and uh, shadows for free. So, so, you know, it's essentially right there in the name. You are tracing rays of light rather than sort of faking it. Uh, the downside is is that it requires a whole bunch of computing power, which is why that's not really used for uh, like real time video games and everything. Mm. Uh, but apparently, Nvidia has uh, specialized uh, graphics cores uh, in their new chips to you know speed this up a little bit. Seems like they're looking to beat out AMD. So uh, let's see then. Uh, along with that, uh, let's see, where where am I at in the show ducks? Oh, there. Uh, Gamescom, which is like a gaming uh, convention in Germany, uh, is next week. NVIDIA are hyping a gaming celebration for next Monday. Uh, everyone's money is on them announcing or and or releasing a Turing-based uh, GeForce product, like a whole lineup. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's going to be the, uh, the 20 XD series. So, like, the GeForce 20 series. Okay. Um, and, and uh, like the Quadros, it's going to be named GeForce RTX, because ray tracing. Oh, ray tracing or RTX, okay. Yeah. Um, of course, they will be backwards compatible with, you know, the, you know, standard rasterization stuff. So, uh -huh. so it's not, it's not like you're going to need another graphics card. So, we're... Video games are need to be made to take advantage of this new uh, hardware, or will it be more of a driver thing? Um, well, I'm assuming that the drivers will be ready on launch, uh, but they will have to be specifically dedicated to this. So it'll easily be another API, uh, yeah. similar to you know how pretty much everyone had to. Rearchitect everything, going from DirectX 11 to 12, and 
to Vulcan from OpenGL. So, um, like, I have a fairly good grasp of how graphics APIs work now. Uh, I'm not sure how a ray tracing API would look like or how uh, you would use it, at least from a programming perspective. Um, but uh, other things are changing, like Java. Uh, in fact, do you use Oracle's uh, virtual machine? It's time to pony up. So apparently uh, Oracle is going to be charging to use their uh, Java virtual machine uh, on corporate desktops and on production servers um, starting, what, in a few months? So uh, they're also going to be shortening the uh, window of releases uh, from like who knows how many years to about six months. Um, and, uh, by the way, just as a note here, uh, open JDK, which is pretty much the default in every Linux distribution, uh, is, and will re- is, and will remain free just like Linux. No. Uh, I almost heard you there. Am I back? Yeah, sort of. Okay. You're, you continue to fade out a little bit. Yeah, I'm not hearing you there. I, I can still hear you. Okay, I just heard that. Okay. All right, so let's talk about Xenon, the Xbox 360 CPU. It had a dangerous CPU instruction that had meltdown-like ramifications. So this is a pretty lengthy article, but I'm going to try to pull out the relevant paragraphs here. Uh, so it's, you know, going over the, uh, the caches, uh, on this chip here and how the core nearest to the level two cache had measurably lower latencies, which I think is, uh, kind of interesting in that, you know, especially because like later on in the later revisions of the 360, they had to add in circuitry to slow it down because the memory controller and everything was all in one chip. Uh, But anyways, he was talking about these caches. Uh, Sometimes temporal locality doesn't actually happen. If you are processing a large array of data uh, that is used once per frame, then it might be trivially provable that it will all be gone by the level 2 cache by the time you need it again. Uh, But you still want the data in level 1 cache so you can benefit... Uh, from the uh, better latency, uh, but having it consumes valuable space in the level 2 cache just means that it will evict other data there, perhaps slowing down the other cores on the chip. Normally, this is unavoidable. The memory coherency mechanism of the PowerPC CPU required that all data in level 1 cache to also be in level 2 cache. Uh, the protocol used for memory coherency requires that when one core writes to a cache line that any other cores with a copy of the same cache line needs to discard it, and the level 2 cache was responsible for keeping track of which caches were caching which addresses. But this is a CPU for a video game console, and performance trumps all, so a new instruction was added, uh, XDCBT. The normal PowerPC DCBT instruction was a typical prefetch, the XDCBT instruction was an extended prefetch that prefetched memory straight to the level 1 cache, skipping level 2. So this meant that memory coherency was no longer guaranteed, but hey, we're video game programmers and we know what we're doing. It will all be fine. Uh, turns out that it was not fine and everything crashed. And uh, then it goes through sort of explaining the... Uh, the pipelines uh, of the CPU, like how, like the individual stages of how each instruction is processed, and says, so the branch predictor makes a prediction, and the predicted instructions are fetched, decoded, and executed, but are not retired until the prediction is known to be correct. Sound familiar? The realization I had, it was new to me at the time, was what it meant to be, uh, let's see, was what it meant to speculatively execute a prefetch. The latencies were long, so it was important to get the prefetch transaction on the bus as soon as possible, 
and once a prefetch had been initiated, there was no way to cancel it. So a speculatively executed XDCBT was identical to a real one. A speculatively executed load instruction was just a prefetch, after all. So, like, apparently they had to attach a debugger uh, to the system. I oh, did see it doing this. Um, and they uh, attached breakpoints to all of these speculative loads. And, you know, as a result, none of them were hit. Like, ever. The program did not crash. So... Uh, but, you know, as soon as they took the debugger off, it started crashing. Uh, so, like, they, they saw in the debugger, like, nothing, like, these these instructions were not being hit. Uh, because, I guess, apparently, when you attach a debugger to it, uh, like, the speculative execution doesn't exactly happen. Oh, that's a horrible bug. Um, so, uh... You know, it doesn't really matter if it was, like, actually executed for real. Just, you know, the fact that the CPU thought, oh, this might be executed uh, later on was, you know, apparently had enough uh, of an effect that, you know, it was just like a real one. So you got some data in your level one cache that's not in the level two cache, which, which violates guarantees. And because you sidestep the rules, bad things will happen. So, uh, let's see, I've, I've wanted to, uh, uh, I, I've been remembering that one, uh, stack overflow quote of like, uh, like a C++ variable being accessed outside of its function, uh, by someone at Microsoft. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll have to, uh, look that up again, but what he said there was like brilliant and involved, uh, being in a hotel room that, uh, you know, might be, uh, crumbling down imminently. Ha. Uh, no windows. I don't want to restart now. So it's always helpful about those things. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, you do you use the RSS reader in Firefox? Uh, I used to use it years ago. I actually don't use it anymore, despite my complaints about it <laughs> going away. <laughs> um, but uh, for not much longer, uh, no one is going to be able to use it because Mozilla is dropping it. Mozilla's engineers said that they plan to remove feed support sometime later this year with the release of Firefox 63 or 64 for October or December. So, uh, Firefox built-in feed reader was once ported to Chrome a few years back, and at least one user has offered to port that extension back. So, um, clever, huh? Mm-hmm. That would uh, solve the problem. That's when I saw that i was like someone should make an extension so at least it won't be uh, gone away that's nice. yeah it uh, might actually be based on the stuff that uh was ripped out which is funny yes it's not like there's really nothing wrong with it they were just concerned that it was old out of date code and wanted to remove it because of that but yeah. i guess that's fair though because it's fluff in your code base it's not really so did you just drop out again I can't hear you anymore. Steve? Andrew? There! It's funny, when I drop out, I can always hear you still. Hmm. But you you are a very important part of this podcast. I'm glad you can hear me now. <laughs> so, um, speaking about Mozilla, uh, I'm pretty sure that they back uh, Let's Encrypt. Uh, and Let's Encrypt uh, recently uh, has finally had their root certificate accepted by all major root programs. So by root programs, I mean like the collection of root certificates that come with browsers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's, you know, Google, Google's uh, roots, there's uh, Apple's, there's Mozilla's, Oracle, I'm guessing for Java, uh, BlackBerry, I'm not exactly sure what uses BlackBerry aside from BlackBerry phones, uh, and uh, now Microsoft. Uh, but you know, due to the fact of slow upgrade cycles, you can't exactly count on the uh, root being in all of them for a few years still. At least they still have the temporary fix for the meantime of having that other trusted root. Yes. Carry them over. So, what have you been up to? Oh, lots of things. Uh, 
from the fringe pictures there. Uh, I was working on building the shack for the goats. It's actually a goat house. Got two goats, two cats, like 36 chickens, four guineas. Actually, six guineas. Two of them died. I uh, mm. went camping this past weekend. Didn't get a sunburn. That's pretty amazing. Should write that one down in the book someplace. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. How about you? Um, so remember when AMP came out that I was sort of, uh, you know, not exactly enthused much about it? Uh, I don't all the way remember. So uh, Google kind of got uh, fed up with uh, slow uh, page load times on uh, phones. Mm-hmm. And that was because like all the scripts and everything were loading them down. Yeah. So they decided to pretty much scrap all of those problematic tags uh, in HTML and just, you know, build something that's, you know, sort of clean uh, and fast. So they created accelerated mobile pages. Uh, that's that's what AMP means. Uh, so I finally gotten around to uh, implementing that, uh, especially after I realized that all I needed to replace were my image tags, uh, which required me to actually uh, load them uh, and uh, only to determine the height and width of the images and put those in the tags. And you know, even though in the future I might decide I don't want AMP anymore, uh, the fact that uh, height and width are uh, on my images are is a good idea for other reasons as well. Uh, mostly for, like, when you load the page, it won't jump around because it already knows the height and width of what the image is going to be on the page. Ah, uh, I remember the dial-up days when it would jump when you're loading the page and the one big image comes and then it jumps onto the bottom. Yes. Uh, let's see, it also has... Uh, uh, CSS uh, restriction in that it can only be up to 50 kilobytes and it has to be directly on the page. It oh, can't... So within the HTML? Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'll make it faster, I guess, though, huh? Yep. Um, and then you... Uh, most... What really irks me the most is that it requires you to embed the AMP JavaScript which is itself about 80 kilobytes. So you have to load this 80 kilobyte JavaScript just to prove that your page is fast. That is kind of funny, because that's more than the CSS they allow, allow you to have. Well, I mean, you don't have to have any CSS at all. Yeah. Well, actually, I take that back. AMP does require a little bit of CSS, like just as as the get-go boilerplate. Uh, I gotcha. Um, uh, I also improved the search feature, uh, and I think I might have mentioned it before, uh, based on trigrams, which, uh, essentially, you know, chop your query up into, like, three-letter chunks, and, uh, with that, it can determine, okay, uh, it looks like you might have misspelled this, or maybe you meant this other thing over here, so... And now your humming thing came back. That's interesting. Must be some process on the on the laptop. So, anyways, uh, that has solved my Borderlands problem. In that, you know, if you if, uh, before if you typed uh, Borderlands with no space, it would work. But if you put Border Space Lands. It would not. It would not come up with anything. Okay. Uh, but with trigrams uh, this way, uh, it'll match it. It'll bring up every article where Borderlands is mentioned, nice. uh, including the articles where I discuss this very problem. So I remember you doing this before, and it was like a feature within the language of the database you were using. It would automatically do this. So now you uh, upgraded it to use a different version of that or this is now you're separating the queries out into three chunks uh it actually adds on to the existing process that i was using so uh before i would create a search index over like the article text of all of my articles uh and then the query would directly look at that index and you know to retrieve the articles 
Uh, but now, uh, there's another, I think it's like another table that I have to put all of the words, uh, in all of my articles in just to say, it's like, okay, well, here's the possible words that are in all of my articles. And then I have to do the trigrams, uh, from the query you put in, uh, versus the list of words in all my articles and then it's like okay well you could have meant uh you know these things it could have been this and oh yeah your your original query words were are also valid too uh, and then i use that query that comes out of the trigrams then i use that on the normal index and get the articles back from there oh i got you okay expanding the query coming in to yeah other it, possibilities. It, it more or less pre-processes the query that comes in yeah pretty cool uh, yeah and uh also i i got around to multi-threading my import and export processes uh and also i found this really sweet font that uh makes me look like uh like some sort of celebrity signing uh posters or something so did you change your site to that font? Um, at least the the headlines and the article tiles titles. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you go directly to the dot com, it looks like uh, somebody signed all of my images. Uh, apparently there's a songwriter Andrew Bailey. You know, I think there is. Yeah. Uh, apparently, I'm also a baseball player, and I think we've already went over this. I think we have. <laughs> so I struggle spelling. Um, actually, you can just uh, click the uh, the title up at the top of the Andrew Bailey at the top of all my web pages, and it'll go to the home page. I got the, the site now. That is a pretty nice font. I like it. Yeah. So if you scroll down almost to the bottom with the Shadow Run Dragonfall. Yes. So you see those two L's there? Yep. They are slightly different. They are. That it's, makes it pretty cool. Yeah. And That's then, not a normal font thing at all. So, and then if you scroll up uh, to responsive images and remote debugging, mm-hmm. the capital R's are different, and the double G at the end of you know in debugging are also slightly different. Yeah, yeah. This this font has like slightly different uh, letter forms for everything. Wonder if it chooses them at random or has an algorithm. Um. So this is actually a feature of uh, open type fonts. Uh, like I think it's a feature called alternative letter forms. Uh, so this particular font has like those big capital letters as the default. Um, and then it also has uh, like the alternatives like that second G, that second L. Pretty much whenever you have two exact letters in a row, mm-hmm. it'll use like a slightly different one. Okay. And if you have two capital letters in a row, it will also use that alternate smaller one. Um, another thing is that if you actually inspect that uh, that headline there, pretty much any any one, you can see that I'm actually dividing it up into smaller spans, and I'm uh, forcing a font feature on like the those other capital letters within those uh, titles. Because I only want the uh, the first capital to be really big, but I don't want any of the other capital letters to be big. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It does make it look really nice. Yeah. It uh, makes it look very natural. I love it. Yeah. Makes me look like uh, a celebrity or a rock star or something. Ah. So. Well, all I have to say is frigid angers are waiting. <laughs> And profound bells excel most. Well, excel most. Uh, I will use the uh, Firefox feed reader uh, to read some of the uh, to read some of the uh, spruce things that have been generated. So, uh, yeah. So I had uh, quite a bit of fun doing that. Um, so, oh yeah. So. Because it was not raining on Sunday, I decided to go out and bike for thirty miles for the wow. first for the first time in about three weeks. Do you feel all sore, or have you kept in shape? 
Um, actually, that was the since that was the first time I uh, did it in three weeks. I did not expect to go thirty miles, uh, but you know I was just pulling up to Station Square there, uh, and I'm like, I can just keep on going. It's it's not like I could even get on the T at Station Square because did you hear what happened there? No, I didn't. So, let's see. You you've actually been down there, right? I'm not even sure. So it's it's on the Mount Washington side of downtown. Okay. So like there's railroad tracks between Station Square and the river, and there's also railroad tracks uh, on the side of Mount Washington uh, on mm-hmm. the other side of Station Square, and the uh, the T line comes out of a tunnel beneath. Uh, that upper uh, tracks and then you know there's a station right there nestled up against the hill and then it sort of like goes up this little hill and across the bridge across the river Um, so uh, Sunday before last um, (laughs) uh, a train on the upper tracks derailed and and crashed down onto the T tracks that and, would definitely cause some damage. Uh, yeah, it was a total mess. In fact, they pretty much had to close down all the roads and stuff uh, next to it for a few days. And uh, so, I forget, like maybe like eight, uh, eight uh, freight cars uh, tumbled down onto the T tracks or derailed at least. Um, Fortunately, they weren't carrying anything too dangerous. It was just uh, household goods, uh, which included Listerine. So you know they they could they could just do it fine. It's the smell it funny there. Yeah, in in fact, uh, like people were you know getting a little you know uh, I'll just say getting a little you know fearsome there. It's like there's some kind of smell coming from there. And then, uh, let's see, I think it was Norfolk Southern owns those rails. And they're like, is Listerine? Don't worry about it. Ah. So, uh, let's see. Of course, when I look at it, it, uh, you know, it's all the recent stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I will go ahead and, uh, I guess I'll put this in the fringe. Uh, but if you Google Station Square, uh, it'll come up with a few, uh, with a few uh, stories here. I'm sure it had some. Yeah. Uh, apparently it's a real mess, and it says that it will be about a month before the uh, Station Square station opens. Sounds like that is. So, uh, well, um, aside from that, uh, I guess I will just... Uh, and uh, <laughs> so to get around this, uh, there's uh, uh, an old... T line that goes through Allentown that sort of goes around all this mess. Uh huh. So like the T is still working fine. Like there's no interruption of service except for that you know station there. You just go around it. Yeah. That works out then, I guess. Yeah, but uh, you know, I guess I guess we'll just have to deal with it as it comes. So, um, so yeah, hopefully the weather will clear up because it's. We're sort of in a rainy pattern here. Yeah, I noticed that. So, you know, I I like it when it does not rain and when it is not hot in the summer. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the rain's always good for the garden. True. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm expecting fall to clear up a little bit because, uh, yeah, this year has been kind of bad for uh, riding bikes. It was either raining or too cold, and or now it's hot. raining or too, or too hot. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. So, uh, anything for you? The deaf chicken has been excelling unawares. Well, you have chickens, so I guess you would know that. (laughs) Ha ha! I do. So, all right. So, that's it. So, watch for cars. Okay. See ya.